I'm Tom Cheshire. I'm associate editor of Wired magazine in the UK. Uh, I do the play section, which is Wired Culture, um, which covers everything, uh, especially Lord Cats, but tonight music. So, yeah. I'm Jason Titus. I'm the CTO of Shazam and uh, a relatively recent transplant to the UK from uh, Silicon Valley. I used to be at Yahoo and before that at Office. I'm Michaela Magnus, um, I'm director at Stromatolite, I'm scientific director of the Roadmap for the Future of Music Information Research, or to, if you put it in plain language, uh, for the future of music technology in Europe. So what we're trying to do is write all the directions that this field needs to take in order to secure more funding in the future and to um, enable this field to grow. Hi, my name's uh, Dave Haynes, and I work for the leading social sound platform, SoundCloud. Um, I also am very interested in music and tech personally, um, and uh, helped organise and, and start the uh, first ever Music Hat Day, which was an event that's now grown uh, into lots of many different countries and cities uh, around the world. Hi, my name is Michael Breidenbrück here. I am uh, the founder of a little company called RJDJ. And I was also the founder of a bigger company, which is called Last Defend. Cool, great. Um, so last time I did a panel with music technology, my first question was quite bullshit: is uh, what's it like to work in the dying industry? To which someone replied, "Well, you should know you're a journalist." Um, <laughs> let, let's be optimistic. Let's say technology saved music. I don't think there are going to be many dissenters here. But let's talk about what's next in research, especially. Um, here we are in Ravensbourne, which is a great research centre. Uh, we've heard from people like Aircam today as well. Uh, we've also got three companies here, entirely private companies that have really sort of taken the field on hugely. Um, Last FM isn't here, but Michael founded Last FM, so we've got representation. Um, so, where's this going to come from? Do we need public institutions funding this sort of stuff, or can we rely on the private sector? Anyway. Well, um, yeah, in in the spirit of, of being a bit challenging here on the panel, I would say, for me it was funny to, at the time when we, when we developed Last FM, when we started up Last FM, I was actually in, working in Ravensport, so I was working in academia. But I found no way how we could combine what we did with Last FM with academia. And I also found no way how we could combine actually a very forward thinking technology and topic with, uh, with research funding. And um, you know, it, it's so funny because later on, after Last FM was a big company, Shazam was a big company, all of a sudden, the university started spinning out programs for music recommendation. And their reasoning why they need you know, funding from the government always was, it's really needed by the industry, look at Last FM and Shazam. And that was so funny because we never actually got any money and I think it's very similar. Yeah, similar. Yeah, I think the, the challenge about making, getting research to be relevant to, to actually getting innovation and new companies out, uh, is there's very specific kinds of research and funding that, that have to come about. I think at one place that uh, shows it pretty well is uh, at Stanford they have a, a program that's like a, it's, it's the design institute that goes to the D school and it's a very different concept of saying uh, rather than you're going to do multi-year really in-depth studies you're going to try things and you're going to fail and failure is accepted and I think that's not necessarily that rapid iteration cycle is something that private industry has pretty, pretty well in, the, in that you run out of money and you fail and that's it so you, you don't really have that many choices except for to try. Uh, and then, but in academia, historically, you can fail for a really long time and maybe still get funded. And I think where, where it can get interesting is where you allow the research, the uh, brain power and the, the, uh, sort of all the, the, the people and attention from universities and apply it in a way that gives people opportunities to try lots of small projects and see whether they work. And I've seen that work in a, a couple of ways. Yeah, yeah, so I, I would totally agree, agree with that. And, and I mean, the whole startup model is, is of course supporting that. But then you have huge 
programs like Michela's um, European EC um, uh, movement for the future of the poo. Uh, Mars attack. Uh, this, is, this is a very rare situation, you know, this program didn't exist before, it was really remarkable that uh, it happened and I will tell you actually how it really happened. Um, I was presenting an interface that was interpreting music uh, that was creating, uh, that was drawing lines of relationships between different cultures in the world based on similarities in their sounds. And there were two European officers who were really forward thinking who were into interfaces because that this wasn't a field that was very much on the agenda. So this is really interesting. We can now understand what this music information field does through this interface. And therefore it was a more of a, um, an approach that you would use in commercial environment in terms of presenting a product, something that interprets the language, something that interprets the technology of research. That, was actually, that actually grabbed their attention. They said, you should come talk to us. And of course, that had no guarantees attached, and that meant four months of eating beans on toast and not sleeping nights and writing a proposal to actually try and secure some funding to take this, this topic forward. But, you know, my approach was, well, glass is half full. If we can actually expand our field, we should try and grab the opportunity, get everybody together, and see what we can, we can do in this respect. Another thing that I would add to your comment, and I totally agree with your approach, this is another approach which works really well in the States, I must say, and I would like to see more of that happening in Britain, is that um, Don Norman has recently um, quoted that we need translational developers. Um, researchers and industry do speak two different languages for very good reasons. Let's not blame each other. Yeah, we can't talk to you guys. We don't know what you guys are talking about. There's a very good reason for it. The researchers do need focus, and they need very high-level focus. And the reason why they come up with great results is precisely because they do have a great deal of focus. But that means that some of us find it inaccessible. On the other hand, industry is very fast-paced. Their headspace has to be in a different area. And it does help. It is not easy to bridge the two. I'm a person uh, who has um, attempted um, um, to do it. I'm, I'm hoping that I am um, managing to bridge it to an extent. It's not easy, but it is necessary to have people who have knowledge of both, and uh, people who are actually able to establish communication between, uh, between industry and, and researchers. I think I think from our from our perspective and from the company perspective, obviously SoundCloud is a is a privately backed venture backed um, company. So we're very much doing innovation, um, you know, in the spirit of having private investment and making a successful business. Hopefully, um, you know, the, our, our two founders both studied um, together in in Sweden. Actually, together they weren't working on the specific project that, they, that SoundCloud has now become, but they they came out of that background. I think for us, in the as a company in the private sector, I think the most you know valuable thing that we can get from um, you know from research and from education from universities right now is to you know for, for those guys to be really building strong programs to build a talent pool from which we can recruit. Like our, our single biggest challenge as a company, you know, is not getting funding, it's not having a good idea. Um, you know, it's, it really is building a team um, and hiring. We, we attend a lot of university events and we really look into that pool for the next people who are, gonna, who are actually going to join our team. So what they've been working on um, in their research, you know, sometimes it does uh, directly correlate. So we have an MIR team and some of those have come back, you know, come out with a more of an academia um, background. But, you know, just like reading that talent pool to get them, like, you know, to move them out of that and then bring their uh, knowledge and their research into the into the private sector, I think is really important. Um, from a from a Music Hat Day perspective, I think that that was a really interesting case where I mean, Music Hat Day essentially came out of um, lots of private companies. It wasn't um, you know a, a research project or something that had funding, um, you know, just to try and innovate. That, that there is a huge amount of space for innovation from those from those private companies, and I think we had a really unique set of circumstances where there was a lot of different companies who were doing innovative things, and by getting together and putting our own commercial money, like it, all of the companies, the first music hat day that we had in, in London was uh, SoundCloud, Songkick, Last FM, Seven Digital, RJ DJ, you know, some of the companies that we're seeing coming out of the scene. 
and by putting a little bit of effort in, by collectively putting in a bit of effort, we were able to create this like breeding ground for innovation um, that was free of sponsors, it was free of um, you know research mandates. It, it really was this playground just to build and, and get people together. But, but, but wouldn't, it wouldn't it be good to have research mandates on hectares? <laughs> Maybe. Um, I mean, some funding for hectares, that would be good. Yeah, I, I think... I think well, the, actually, actually, we are co-sponsoring the Sonar Hack Day, yeah. so with the Mirrors Grant, so yeah. we are... We are yeah, right. I think I think for those things it's good to have that melting pot of different people. So you know now we're seeing a situation where yes, you know we've done you know in the uh, you know we work closely with uh, with Barcelona um, with those guys there, but there was also um, you know funding from brands, there was funding from private companies, and I think the important thing is with that innovation. Like I, I've seen a lot of it happen without having any agendas, and I think the more agendas you start putting in. The more, the more um, parameters and the more like rules that you put around what that innovation should be about, um, you know that that isn't where we're going to find the true innovation. Is, you know, when there's no agenda, when it's people just coming together and like you know mixing and meddling different ideas from all these different sectors, I think that's really where the, where the true innovation is. Is, is that because once you get this stage, compared to say, if you speak about research leading to innovation, you look at America and Silicon Valley as like the ideal example of that academic projects being spun out into sort of world beating businesses. Is that because what we're doing now is remixing rather than truly innovating? We're building on each other's APIs, we're taking these tools available for all of us and making them into something new, but it's a remix culture rather than a true innovation culture. Mm, always has been a remix of innovation. I don't see the difference between the innovation and remix. There is no such thing as pure innovation that comes out of no, 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 okay, I didn't think I was going to say, like, I just invented the internet, that is not happening, fine, it's based on things, but music seems to be a world where everyone feeds off each other a lot more, where there are, it's not so much about big technological breakthrough that leads to something, rather than everyone getting together, does that make sense? But I think quite often innovation happens when you get lots of different ideas together in a room. So you're not you're ne not necessarily remixing something, or it's that kind of fusion of different things where you know somebody somebody could be, and I'll just use the Mac Music Hack Day example again. But there might be somebody in the room who's you know using pure data, or there might be someone in the room who um, you know can't code at all, but they've got a really great idea. There might be somebody who who comes from you know I've seen a lot of hardware hacking at these events, but there seems to be four or five disparate kind of groups who are all doing this separate stuff in, in different disciplines, but as soon as they come together, it's like, oh, wow, well, you're doing this and I'm doing that. So, you know, there's this other thing. And, they, they, you know, actually at the event, there might be just something which is just using APIs, and, but, but it's the, the ideas and the teams and the, the melting pot that creates yeah. that, that ultimately leads to the true innovation. I think the, the, the key, one of the key pieces of that is you know, if you have a full-on research department way down in the depths of some specific field, the odds that they're going to have a groundbreaking idea within that group about how to move the entire field forward is actually not that common because it is often, I know in the field of medical research it's happened a bunch of times, I think some of the, uh, one of the bigger things around like uh, heart valves and all that came out of a electrical engineer who actually just hung out with uh, folks going, you know, that's a simple problem, which is like things I do all the time in, in my world. Yeah, let me, and, and they end up going and working together and they come up with really innovative things. And it, hack days are sort of an exemplary, and you know, uh, a great example of that in that they do it over a short period of time. But where, where I think you can actually take research and make it product is when you can come up with ways to get those groups together. Like I've seen it, you know, uh, recently, you know, Google essentially got rid of Google uh, Research, right? They sort of merged it all in. Uh, I've seen uh, at, at Alta Vista there was a, a really great research team and a, a great tech team, fully separate, working on different things. And it wasn't until we actually, we actually said, here's a really big problem that has to be solved. And, you know, pick folks on the research side who said all these, you know, had lots of ideas that have been very critical for a long time. Pick the sort of the sharpest one and said, you're paired with this really sharp engineer, figure it out. And all of a sudden, things that have been intractable and people said you couldn't do were solved. Um, so, I mean, you mentioned D School and companies like Google. Uh, at the same time, it seems to be Europe that's really leading the way with music at the moment. Like, you heard Napster and MySpace, but since then, it's really been all up. Why is that if we don't have this collaboration? I don't know. I think my 
theory would be that it's not that that's not about research. Okay. Uh, I think that's probably more about culture. Okay. Well, what is it about European culture as opposed to U.S. that has you know, seen you over there? You know, Americans spend so much time watching television. We've been doing a lot of television. Yeah, that, that's that's a very big thing for our company uh, now, and I think that is actually an element of it. That while music is huge in America, that there is that there's a the actual time spent is is disproportionately on television, uh, and that probably maybe reduces the amount of attention on music innovation that you would have otherwise. That being said, I mean, there's there are. I have been to Music Hack Days in the States, and there's a lot of people who care about it, there's a lot of innovation, it's just not, uh, it's not Spotify or SoundCloud or... or I'd say long, long nights in Scandinavia in winter, and uh, snowy winters in Austria, right Michael? Yeah. And I make you sit on the computer and think of what you can do with music and what you can do with apps. Thank you for saying that, well, Angry Birds as well. Right, yeah. there you go, yeah, absolutely. Um, do you guys agree to way for longer we've got the setup now that we've got this ecosystem of people like like what you're doing last time and going on to do different companies everyone makes them amazing. Do you well, think we've got that too? Cafe culture that's sorry I'm, uh, cafe culture does breed the idea of hanging out together and of course Silicon Valley really relies on cafe culture as well, doesn't it? Yeah. So and Europe's built on it. So I would encourage it. I mean Michael Yeah no I mean I think there's of course uh, I mean Today, happening a lot of stuff in Europe, in Berlin, in London, and so on. I mean, I remember when we started last FM compared to, you know, now it's like it's a different era in what kind of companies you see, how startups work, and all of that. The one thing, though, that I would say, um, which I think is a bit, a bit funny in Europe, is actually that because I mean, many of the founders in the States, you know, exit there big or small, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, I mean, even if it didn't work, they still managed to do an entire uh, kind of sell of their assets, they got a bit of money and started their next thing, and, and in Europe, I see so much companies who actually won't make it, and it's not just even get a bit of money, you know, to actually start their next thing, so, but like completely destroy the technology because the business case didn't work. From a SoundCloud perspective, I mean, we don't, we almost don't even really think about different countries. It's just the internet with a bit of inconvenient flying in between. Right? <laughs> and you've got different pockets, you know, doing different things. So, you know, we have um, SoundCloud's based in Berlin. We moved there. And there was companies like Ableton, like Native Instruments. But you know, we really moved there just because there was this. It was, it wasn't in a bubble. It was just itself, and there was a bit of a kind of punk kind of counterculture that, that we really wanted to be in to, to start growing our company. But um, you know, we quickly realised that while well, if we're building a product that's going to be heavily used by the music industry, then we need to have a London office. So you know, we opened the London office very early on, and now you know, again in the next stage of our evolution, it's like well. Like what you were saying, you know, we need to be close to the, you know, to the valley. So we have we have our San Francisco office, and we're close to the, the Twitters and the Facebooks and the, and the Googles and people like that. So I think you have to, you know, if you're interested in this scene, you really need to be understanding where all those different pockets of innovation. And I think there's going to be new ones emerging as well. You know, somewhere like Helsinki, there's a really interesting startups there. But we, every week in my in my inbox, there's a new kind of, oh, we'd love to do a music hack day in Mumbai or in um, Turkey or in. So, you know, there's, there's all these different clusters, so I think the more that we can do to connect all those different clusters, then, you know, that, that will raise the whole lot. Uh, has it changed the game for, um, you guys say, SoundCloud raised about $50 million from Silicon Valley versus Shazam for about $32 million, quite a lot of money. Um, does that change the focus slightly if you go from that punk Berlin <laughs> thing to, like, okay, actually, you probably just work out in yeah, I, I mean, I think yeah, I think you, it, it would be a lie to say to say no. But um, I mean, I think when when you're doing something, you know, for SoundCloud, you know, we want to change how the world thinks about sound. You know, we want to unmute the web. We want to be as big as YouTube, but but for sound, um, and you can't really achieve those you know those groundbreaking you know th those really revolutionary changes. They're not going to happen without like some type of funding. Um, you know, that's not why you're doing it, that's not your key driver. Um, but if, if that's what you're trying to do, then obviously you need to, you need to facilitate it. I, I think, uh, I mean, for, 
for Shazam, it's actually we're in a pretty good spot because uh, what we help people do is find out more about things they like, and so uh, it's always Shazam's actually been making real revenue for a very long time. You know, we sell over a hundred million. We drive over a hundred million dollars worth of music, music purchase every year. I mean, so all the we work with music labels, we work with iTunes and Amazon and everybody, and so it's actually it's one of the rare places that I've gotten to work where. All interests are aligned. Like it's our job to do as good a job as possible, in helping people find what they're looking for, and then making it easy for them to get it. And so then the people who actually have the content want to work with us to make sure that they can do that smoothly. And then you can we, we can just sort of build on top of that. And with the advertising, it's the same thing. Like you make sure you make advertisements assemble. It's only the people who care and are interested in them who shazam them. And then you get to find out more about that, that ad that you saw. You say you like that car and you can be flipping through it. And let's talk about, um, so I don't know how much so Shazam's music startup has now recently started, recently they started doing TV. Um, how much of what we're learning from like, music tech applies to other fields? I think like my industry publishing, what, what lessons could we learn from how to present digital content, how people find it, how people share it? What can be taken away and explored into other industries? So for us, we found that it's, it actually has a huge amount of synergy because it really is about uh, understanding what people are trying to find, in our case, by you know, hearing what's around them and being able to give them informa more information. And we already have enough experience from, from actually years of saying, okay, here's how we can present it to you, here's how we can help you keep it and, get, and bring it back. That, uh, yeah, there's lots that's changing. That's, that's new for everybody, like distributing things through Facebook and Open Graph and Twitter and all these things that, that weren't major factors before. But a lot of that baseline uh, ends up applying. So, I mean, my for instance, your, um, there's no real distinction between music and games for you. Maybe is that what I say? Um, yeah, I mean, there were a couple of really great examples in the past where sort of music and gaming kind of worked really well together. And um, but uh, but I think games. I'm actually not sure if it is that such a good example because music isn't software. And distributing software and distributing just data is actually a totally different game. And I actually think what is interesting is for the music industry learning from the software industry, the publishing industry learning from the, from the software industry, uh, the, I don't know, uh, TV industry learning from the software industry. And that's really what's, what's happening now. I think, I mean, the, the, the transition that the music industry was going through is mainly driven by the software industry. And now you can see that that's happening in many different areas. Uh, so it's really software and technology that's that's really driving a lot of stuff. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's interesting because music, the music industry, kind of bore the brunt in a way. You know, it was, it was the first to suffer. You know, the, the technology it really disrupted that industry before it disrupted books, before it disrupted publishing. Um, you know, the, the disintermediation happened a lot quicker. Um, I, I hope that we've now kind of we being the music industry, I, I hope that the music industry has turned the corner and is now looking to, you know, it's, it's at that inflection point where it can really grab technology and, and learn from it and re, if it can restructure its business in time, then I think there's a massive opportunity. Um, and I do worry that, you know, you, you look at other industries, I know people have moved from the music industry to the book industry, and it's, it's like going back Wait, five you years. And, and you go to, it's always funny when you go to conferences and um, yeah, I, was at, I was at a radio conference, um, this was actually last year, and it was, it was just full of people who were still doing things like they've been doing for 20 years. And I'm like, wow, like we're having conversations that we were having in these kind of panels like five years ago. Like, I, can't, I can't believe you're, you're going through the same issues. And it's, you know, I'm, I don't want to say the writing's on the wall, but I think the, the quicker an industry can structurally adjust, which is never easy, it's like moving an oil tank. Yeah, um, I mean, has been the structure of justice, so the RIA is suing my wife for like, like $73 trillion, which is more than the GDP of the world. Yeah, yeah. I think There's more money than there is in the world, they're suing for, right? It's not done yet, is it? Yeah. I, I, I mean, true, I, I, you know, there's, there's still kind of undercurrents of that. I think, I think a lot of it just needs to come from the grassroots level. I think you need to, that, that was kind of one of the, one of my own personal motivations for setting up something like Music Hacking, was I was just 
I was just sick and tired of people talking about this stuff on panels. You know, YouTube and being a panel, I know there is actually. But it was like, yeah, it's, but it's, yeah, just drinking beer and talking about stuff. Just because you were all available at this time, so we can get you all together in some sort. But, but it, was, it, was, it was like, no, actually, let's, let's cut all of that crap, let's, let's not deal with that whole side of the industry, let's just go and do something and show people, like, let's just build something in 24 hours that you might have invested a million dollars on a, you know, like, whatever doing. Let's just go out and show you the opportunity. And I think if we, if we can really, instead of having this kind of, um, you know, this side versus that side, if we could just, like, shut up and just kind of show people what the opportunities are. There's always going to be the lobbying at a bigger scale, but I know in a way it's, I, I feel like it's a bit of a distraction. So you're just ignoring that, that's really just ignoring it. Yeah, I mean, I, actually looking at this thing historically, I think that music always embraced technology in a great way. And I mean, of course, when someone uh, a long time ago invited, in, invented radio, <laughs> uh, maybe there were bands out there who said, like, radio. Uh, you know, now I don't need to play live and don't get money paid for playing live. Uh, but, but actually, the whole industry evolved really when, when radio, when recorded music came along, and you could see there's a whole bunch of technical developments in the, in the past that actually pushed the music industry forward. And, and if they made money or not, or lost money or whatever, that's a totally different thing. But music in itself, you know, really came a long, long way since the last, I don't know, 100 years. And that's a, that's a great thing. Is that the future? So, we listen to songs that are three minutes long, which is like a motel convention. Um, and I hang up the technological glass of having a lineup. Michael, is sort of the playing around with music within parameters, which you're saying a lot of artists is doing, is that the future of creativity in music? Or will all these things exist side by side? Is Coldplay ever going to actually do an RJ DJ stuff again? Not that I'm aware of, but you never know. No, but uh, I mean, of course, for me, from my side, looking at it, I think that, especially what I said before, that, that actually the soft, you know, distributing software, distributing music, and I think that we are now at an infliction point where, where to call it infliction point? Ah, good infliction. So, <laughs> so we're now at this moment in time where actually music could be distributed as software. Yeah, but that changes a lot of things, of course, again, but, but because so many you know, artists work with software creating music, but then they render it down, distribute it as data, so why is that? Yeah? And uh, for me, that, that's, that's super exciting because, of course, that will also change music. You know? So, technology and music are so... It does. It they are changes. the biggest buddies. <laughs> it, it also changes the way you make music. So, you mentioned Coldplay. I, I thought first hand from someone within the MR that last time they tried to do a remix of their record, they had to spend five hours listening to all the tapes from the original recording, trying to figure out which piano tape was in the original. And without technology to support them, this is incredibly inefficient and is actually astonishing for some of us who are working in technology because we know exactly how to solve that problem. So it's not only distribution, it's making music that technology can aid with and there's an entire process. So I call it the song line person, maybe it's just a little moniker and far, but it's a song line process of where you how you make music. I inject it with technology, with tagging, with whatever else, with, uh, with fingerprinting, whatever else you're going to do at that point, and take it through the whole process and follow the whole social network that develops around each step of the way. Technology can aid the music industry tremendously. I think that's interesting with SoundCloud. So, well, I think we could, um, a lot of people, and many people don't understand how to make things. Like we try, try and keep up with it, but it's just too far apart. Whereas, like, SoundCloud, we consume it too. Um, people are just using that already to change the way. I mean, Dead Mouse is quite a good example of working with the fans. Is, is that a new sort of way of making music, or is that kind of like a publicity thing at yeah. the same time? Um, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, in terms of, like, fans being creators, I mean, I think that's one like, big thing that SoundCloud really believes in. Like, we, we think that everybody should be able to be a sound creator. Um, you know, and I think we've, we've learned the lesson from other forms of media, like video, Everybody, well, you know, text. Everybody is their own journalist nowadays. You know, you have a blog, you can tweet, you can you can form opinions, and you can publish them to millions of people. 
I mean, the same with photos. You know, I'm, I'm not a you know, professional photographer, but I, I pay for a Flickr account, I use Instagram, and you know, I'm publishing day in, day out. Video is probably the best example where you know, video was extremely hard to make. You, know, you had to be a good director, you had to have you know, great equipment. Like nowadays, if, if I look at what my nephew, my nephew is eight years old, I think. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't spend his weekends watching films. I mean, I'm sure he does sometimes. Um, but he spends his, he, he spends his uh, weekends making like videos. Um, you know, he'll get, he'll do the Lego stock animation stuff. He'll, he'll be using iMovie and, and kind of, you know, chopping and, and doing some really kind of quite advanced things that you, you know, George Lucas would have only dreamed of doing when, when he was 20. So I think I, I would love to see that um, revolution happen with sound and you know, just specifically with music. And I think. You know, everybody can be a music creator. I don't think that necessarily harms the art form of being the original creator. I think it, it somehow amplifies it. But there, there's all these different ways, and I think it, where I'm excited about technology is, you know, we've we've completely innovated. We've completely disrupted consumption. You know, that piece is done now. You know, I, I have a device. I can listen to any track I want, anywhere I want. It's social. It's engaging. You know, that that piece is done. Curation. People are working on the curation piece because. As soon as you've got maximum consumption, you need better curation. And for me, the next, like, you know, if you think consumption, um, curation, the next two steps along the line are collaboration and then creation. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to be, be the best creator, but somebody like, you know, like Ninja Tune is building a really great app at the moment called Ninja Jam, which just allows any Ninja Tune fan of which I want to be able to pick up one of, you know, a cold cut track or something and make their own version. And I think that, that collaboration is well. Yeah, we, we, we spent a lot of time integrating SoundCloud into GarageBand and um, the Korg's IMS20 and all these, like the, I, re I remember speaking to you three years ago and you were saying, you know, the iPhone had just completely, completely changed, changed, you know, before, like now you've got this device that just completely enables all of those types of behaviours. Everybody has a microphone in their pocket, everybody has a studio in their pocket, and it's, it's a, it's a big revolution. I, I would urge anyone in the audience who's working on these types of problems, yeah, if you've got a great idea of consum consumption and curation, by all means, go ahead with it. But there's so much innovation left to happen in the creation space. Um, cool. Um, one last question for every person on the panel. Um, what was the last thing you saw the music tech that really excited you? It could be a product, a company, a person, an idea. Um, just one by one, then we'll have some audience questions. Yeah, I, I mean, I can start. <laughs> It's a crazy story, I don't know if I can actually tell it, but I saw this guy from Israel and he was on the panel, yeah, and, and he said, you know, the f future content is going to be injected in your body. There's no interface anymore, it's your body is the interface. And they were talking and blah, 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 no one actually got that guy, what the heck is he talking about, about injecting stuff, yeah, and I was like, Man, that's a weirdo, yeah? And then this whole thing was over. And there was just a couple of guys standing around. There was one of the guys who was like, hey man, you should try my thing, yeah? And I was like, yeah, why not, yeah? So then I go to this thing, and he puts uh, on my heels, two things on my heels, one thing here, and one thing on my, on my belt. And then he just played music. I had headphones, and he played music. I was like, yeah, music, and then he said, now I switch it on. <laughs> and I was blown away. I mean, seriously, it was injected into my body. That's the only way how to describe the musical sensation I had. So what the guy had was these, these little kind of needles almost, which were, um, which were uh, vibrating in, in, the, in the bass, and, and they, were, they were sort of stimulating your, what's it called, media, medium, what's the, this the Chinese, what? Yeah, those, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this, there's these special points in your body, and those were, and it was, it was massive, seriously. Uh, I forgot. <laughs> you so overwhelmed. No, I can, I can, I can find it out for you. But it was just massive because actually I realized how much my whole body is listening versus just my ears. Yeah, I, I, I've got a few different things. I mean, it, it is that there's just new stuff happening every day. I mean, I, if I've only gone to pick one, 
um, I would say, so I was, I was at a conference, again, you know, sitting in a room with all these different panels, people talking about the future of music, and, and it was uh, in Mumbai, in India, and everybody, you know, the big thing there was like, oh, music in the cloud, and oh, consumer music subscription services, and how can we maximize the revenue out of, you know, there's a billion people, let's get all their money, and etc. etc. et cetera. And, you know, that was fine, you know, the industry has to do that. And then, in one of the breaks, um, there was a performance by someone called Imogen Heap, which I'm sure everyone's uh, uh, familiar with. And she had these things, these magic gloves. And I, I kind of saw these magic gloves and I was like, I mean, Imogen's fantastic, she's done some really innovative things, you know, and she, she always tries to, and I, a part of me was like, oh no, this is going to be awful, uh, this is going to be terrible. Um, you know, it's going to be really innovative, but it's just not going to, you know, sometimes I think with those types of things, you can be really innovative, but then the musicality is just, it's not there. The art is the innovation, not the actual music is the art form. And she just, she blew the entire audience's mind. And this is kind of, you know, suited, you know, 30 year old like, kind of industry guys. And she had, this, so she had these gloves and she was able to, she played with this Indian flautist and she was able to like just pull with her, and it was the performance that she brung to the technology as well. So she was able to like draw the flute sounds with her and she was like singing a cappella and then like kind of, she was able to reverse it and stop it and do all these different things with these amazing gestures. So it was, for me, it was really exciting because it was a, a really great example where technology was kind of helping this collaboration. So two musicians actually collaborating with each other, but then also the performance, like she was able to deliver that performance. and. Just, it was a new way of performing and creating music in front of an audience, which I had never seen. And I was, I was kind of moved to tears in a way. I was like, oh wow, this is finally, somebody's finally now. It was, it was, it was incredible language and stuff. And it, that seems to be a trend actually, is people, um, rather than going away fiddling on the seat through a keyboard, um, actually bringing out the underlying magic behind it, making it real as it's sort of, I think we'll see more of that. But that, that, was, that was a good example where collaboration was important, because I think, I can't remember, somebody else might know, but I, the, the, the actual technology was built somewhere at, at MIT or something like that. So, you know, you've got these great, we're using accelerometer da data to do this, and we're using processing to do this, and we're using... But, but the, it was getting her, as a performer, to understand that technology, to really demonstrate it, which is the thing that I've never seen before. Um, I, would, I would agree with both these guys, and actually I think you know, you're developing a pattern here because there's a great deal of gestural and performance stuff coming out. Uh, I, would, I would probably say that, <laughs> that Jason's going to probably uh, quote something like that. So actually what I'd like to do is, rather than the latest, I'd like to mention probably a seminal moment in something in, 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 our, in our landscape, and that was when Bjork decided to use Reactable to record a Volta album. And this was before she did Biophilia, which was an app, and which then used a whole series of different innovations within our field um, to create music. And when she decided to use Reactable, which was the first musical instrument that was actually using elements of the analog synth to um, create a tangible, tangible interface, the whole landscape changed, because all of a sudden people could perform, um, people could collaboratively uh, perform on this instrument and she demonstrated how you can create music that is, as you say, something that really moves you, that's not just um, just uh, for the sake of demonstrating a tool. Um, and I, I, would, I would pick that as probably one of the most important things that has happened within, within our field. Yeah, well, I'm going last. <laughs> so, now, uh, the, uh, the, the area around gestural interaction of music to me is, is just so, Anytime you can take a technology and bring it down to actually, you know, applicability for the average person on the street, I think that is where the pace of the change just accelerates. Because you take something, you know, whether it's, you know, I, I mean, it's not the most easy to use offer in the world, but it, it was a little, you know, order magnitude easier so that people could actually make videos. And I think some of the things that are happening now, and whether it's iPad apps or iPhone apps or uh, the one that really got me was, uh, was somebody from the MIT Media Lab who actually had a whole setup with uh, essentially just using little electrical bits to make anything a UI, whether it's water or little bits of Play-Doh and all that, and lay out keyboards or drums or whatever on any surface. Um, those, those kinds of things get, I, I think, I'll take them. I'll get that one. Great, um, so we're running for one. Uh, does anyone in the audience have a question? Everyone sticks their hands up. Who to pick from? <laughs> yes. Uh, is that right? Yeah, I'll take my chance.
Hello. Um, maybe this is a bit of a SoundCloud specific question. Uh, sorry. Uh, but you've recently done a collaboration with Ableton where people can publish their tracks directly to SoundCloud. Um, and you mentioned multi track stuff before. Is there any plan to kind of expand SoundCloud to include multi track um, stuff where people can just publish their entire production online? Well, I mean, I think one, one good example of that, I think like, actually on SoundCloud itself, um, it is about publishing the, the finished recording, you know, you know, it could be expanded upon that. Um, uh, one guy, a uh, group of very clever guys at Korg, they, um, they reproduced the IMS-20, the classic IMS-20, the classic MS-20, uh, onto, the, onto the iPad and they actually built, we built some special hooks into our API so that they could actually share, it's kind of almost invisibly done, but they, they actually share the entire session via the SoundCloud API. So if you if you download, I think Gorillas have done a, a version, there's the, the um, Korg Electri. But anyway, so within the IMS 20, they have this almost like sharing community. So you can you can go and record something, you share it via SoundCloud, but actually within the app, um, you can go back to the original session. So the, the data file of that session is stored. We put that back so you can, you know, if, if you were doing a track, you could say, hey, you know, like Dave, here's my track. And then I could go in and, and edit it and, and then reshare it again. So, um, yeah, I definitely think it's that was an interesting way to see yeah, that, that kind of collaboration happen as well between you know, technology enabling two different musicians. Um, to be together. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, guys. I'm just reading here from the ES Magazine today, this is an interview with Philip Tracy. He's a hat maker and he says that uh, one fact that at uh, one point in London we had 7,000 hat makers. Now we only have seven, you know. Bring that to music, it'd be the opposite, you know, because of technology and that's what I do. I also teach music, how to use you know, technology to create music. Maybe there's, I don't know, half a million of people in London creating music, some of it amazing, you know, you know, some not so good, you know. So my main problem is that from the creative perspective, how to monetize that, you know, from the artist perspective, these tools are amazing, but everyone creates stuff and SoundCloud is amazing, Spotify is amazing, but from the hundreds of, of, of plays that my music gets for the past months, doesn't pay for my dinner tonight, you know, just, just one dinner. So from the artist perspective, how, how can, people in the long tail, let's say, not like the big names, you know, make a living, not just through the business, but from the artist's perspective. I mean, I would say probably most of those, a lot of those hat makers decided to, to do something else to make their main living. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of an unsatisfactory short answer. Um, you know, I think, I think, <laughs> Um, a, a better answer to that would be, um, I think if you can, I don't think artists should necessarily be worried about the fact that, you know, we could see what we're saying here is that any, you know, I would say anybody can be a music creator. I don't think the, 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 the people at the top of that pile should be necessarily worried that anybody could, could practice the same craft. And I would like to think that if you are at the, if you are at the top of the game and you're doing genuinely something interest, interesting and you're creating a movement around it, then um, you know, having all these people emulating you should hopefully kind of rise you to the top. So um, people who aren't at the top, well, yeah, there's so much noise, how do you get to that? It, it does mean that you somehow, I mean, it, like, honestly, it does mean there's still a lot of hard work. Um, but I mean, it was always a lottery. Before, before we had this democratisation, I would argue it was just as hard, if not harder, you know. It was the record labels were the kingmakers. Unless you got played on radio, unless you got picked up by a major record label, you didn't have a chance in hell anyway. So you, you were playing the lottery at that point, at least this way, if you're doing something genuinely interesting, if you're doing something different to the other 700 hat makers, you know, there was probably 700 people making the same hats, but the seven that survived were the people who somehow built up a loyal customer base, people who were buying their hats and, and keeping the quality thorough and like innovating and, and things like that. So, yeah, I don't know, that's not, probably not, Particularly satisfactory answer if you are, you know, one of those over 700 <laughs> hundred hat makers. But really, yeah, but at least you you have the opportunity now to build your audience. In terms of where you make your money, I think the I think the smart artists, the, the smart artists will think that you, <laughs> the smart artists 
Um, or think beyond, like, you know, it used to be, okay, I, I used to run a record label, we used to get 4.95 as the trade price for selling an album. And so our entire business model was, um, you know, was built around maximizing how many 4.95s we could put on an Excel spreadsheet. And you, you had different levers to make the number of 4.95s go up or down. I think nowadays the, the transactional value of music has gone down to microsets. Um, so, you know, you can build that in aggregate, um, but you have to be looking what are the other things that can make me £100, can make me £500, um, you know, whether that's a tour or a merchandise or, or things like that. So, I think it's hard work. I mean, it's not easy, um, but at least everybody has the opportunity to build an audience. And I think success follows them. I think also in terms of music technology that's available, uh, there are new tools coming out which enable artists to manage themselves, to follow the trends, to follow the numbers of downloads. Um, for instance, BuzzDeck, which um, um, is a recent tool, uh, enables you to see uh, clusters of fans. If you have a television appearance in Britain, it will show you that people in Belgium and in Holland are downloading your tracks, having seen the BBC, which is something that you wouldn't necessarily as an artist do. Do we want our artists to be social media experts? Well, of course they, they don't have to, but they seem to have to they seem to have to be multi-skilled in this day and age. The other thing is obviously it's dramatic, like we're actively building tools which help you discover new artists by um, searching through sort of the sort of songs that you like and sort of matching them. So um, there are technologies that are coming out that are helping people. Of course, we don't give a direct answer, as, as, as David has quite rightly explained, you know, it's not a simple thing to just generate a business model and serve it to someone. But there's a case of them seeing what is available. All these new things are available. So this new business models are emerging. I think the reality you're saying that we don't want our staff to be uh, social media experts, but if you look back, you know, successful artists actually in the past really either had to be very lucky, very well connected, or work their asses off, making connections, getting out, touring, and most of the time, a huge portion of the money that we made from their their music and their shows and their merchandise would go to others, not to themselves. And I think one of the things that is, is changing now is because the friction involved in all of those pieces and that entire pipeline of getting music to a user has gotten so low that I think the opportunities for actual artists to, to take ownership over selling their own merchandise, managing a bunch of things around their own tour and how they distribute their music, I think that's, so that's the new ground for them. Uh, yeah. Uh, ooh. Where, where, where do you want to go? Some flurry. I was doing. Um, we'll go right in the front start. Then one more. You guys can duke it out. Hello. Um, my name is Priya. I'm an A consultant, stroke tutor. And sorry, SoundCloud again. <laughs> Another question. Um, it's regarding about how you recruit young people to gain new skills and to grow your company. So you mentioned before, you kind of struggle getting people to work at your company in terms of working at universities and colleges, but do you look at specific specialist music organisations, um, do you look at secondary schools or those who are looking to expand the music industry themselves, like if they have no experience or if they they have experience but producing or learning a business knowledge course, is that something where you would look towards if you're looking for like a new talent pool? So it's quite a long I question. Guess, I guess Shazam and, and Aja DJ could, could probably answer that question as well. But um, I, mean, I think it, it depends if it's um, it depends whether it's a developer or, or business. I think I think that the two paths into what you do um, are slightly different. Um, I and mean, I think if you're a if you're a developer, then then the way in is really to kind of well either to be doing a very specific program and doing research and, and building up a strength in a particular area, whether it's um, you know, MIR or thing, you know, like those types of things. Um, or if you're a developer, just like building like great projects, like actually showing, you know, we, we would, first thing we do is go and look at the developer's GitHub page, for example, see what projects they're working on, see what code they're committing, um, etc. And we have actually hired quite a lot of people through Music Hack Days um, because they can actually come and build something. Um, on the business side, um, I mean, I guess it's the same kind of thing. It's, it, I think the way in is to really show that you're, you've got something very special that, that's different from everybody else. Um, I think that's, that those are different things from different companies. Um, we actually, we, we, we did have a stage where we used to hire a lot of interns, um, but we've actually cut that down um, because we felt 
but it's, it's actually quite difficult to onboard those people when you're such a fast-paced moving company. Um, it's actually really difficult to have lots of people who are uh, much more junior coming onto the team. So if you're trying to get your first round of the ladder, I, I, would, I would definitely also really try and look out for what are the other companies, what are the other small companies that are breaking out now. Um, you know, they, they, there's probably a ton of four or five people companies who are doing very exciting things and will go on to be the next Shazams or the next um, Facebook sort or whatever. So it's really kind of getting to know those people and just and just offering to do do great things for them. Just go in and say, look, I I think I could do this for you. I mean, I I, I wasn't part of the founding team at SoundCloud, but I got there very early on because I knew what they were doing. I got to know the founders and I said, look, I'm going to show you that I can do this and, and brought something to them and then did it. So. Um, yeah, I think if you just have to be out there doing things and showing that you can, um, yeah. yeah. Um, can we take, there are two questions there, can we just take them both in turn and then we'll answer both Okay. Again. Was it you? Hi, uh, General, this is a question for the panel. Uh, what would you say to a young up-and-coming artist if they wanted to break into the music industry? Would you suggest that they chase the big record company deal or just do it DIY? The reason why I ask that question is because increasingly record companies are trying to get artists to sign these 360 degrees, which means that they cheekily own everything, including the merchandising, touring receipts, that type of thing, which historically used to belong to the artists. So, so what we've got a situation is where the music industry is desperately trying to hang on to this old model, but expand it. And obviously you guys are introducing new technology to empower um, artists to do you know, interesting, crazy things. So essentially, what would you suggest to a young artist coming through? Go for that big record company deal, or just try and do it by yourself with all the technology available to you? Um, well, it's actually related to your business models. I mean, all of you actually um, rely heavily on the artists, and um, it's what are you actually giving back to the artists uh, individually and as a company? Um, so, DIY or record label first thing? <laughs> there, is, there is a third option, of course. There are record labels now, rather new types of uh, companies that are offering new types of contracts to artists, uh, where they enable, enable the artist, they, they don't actually own everything that the artist does, they actually give the freedom to the artist to use tools to, pro to promote themselves, the artists own their own promotional tool. Uh, people like artists without a label, for instance, um, they've attracted even people like Moby and Paul York. We've worked with them for a long time precisely because of that, because we were able to clear the music that we were working with for similarity uh, research, and we were able to come up with tools because their contract states that they are able to use up to 30 seconds of the artist's music. Uh, they've now been oh, bought by a company called Cobalt, who has grown a tremendous amount in the US in the last couple of years, I believe 60%, it's a big shopping, and that's because they were offering new types of contracts to artists, much faster paychecks, and basically uh, a much uh, more streamlined um, relationship. So there are new options out there, it's actually a case of, of uh, looking out for them, and uh, obviously uh, there this is something that I would, I would recommend artists do. It is very difficult to do it on your own. A few people have cracked it, we know who they are, they've been heavily publicized, but this is, I'm sure that you've had the same experiences, sort of very, very few and far between. And, and Dave, so today, slow news day in the technology world. Um, Facebook, if you're not paying for it, you're the product, famously, um, our artists, SoundCloud's product, and they're getting social. But just, just to answer the, the, the first question, I think you, you need, kind of need to think of yourself in the same way as a startup would think of themselves. And, um, you know, SoundCloud, we, you know, we bootstrapped, we didn't pay ourselves, you know, we, we built a product and we showed that we had traction and we showed that we had users. So I think wh whatever you do as an artist, you, you, you need to build your own audience and you don't, you don't get a record deal by making great music and sending someone a, a demo. That is harder than winning the lottery. Like what you do do is you build a loyal audience of a thousand fans, then five thousand fans, then ten thousand fans, and then at the point where you've got that audience, it's hard work. Like don't get me wrong, it's hard work. You need to be making 
exceptional music and you need to be great at building an audience, which is, you know, you might need support from that, from friends or somebody who loves your music or, or a manager or something like that. But as soon as you build that audience, the choice is yours. You can either, you can do it yourself. You don't need a record label. You could, if, you're, if your audience is loyal enough to you, you can raise on Kickstarter, you can play a lot of shows and keep bootstrapping. Um, but I certainly wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't rule at that point taking a major, major record label deal. But you need to realise it's the same as taking a Series B or Series C or taking venture funding, going back to the startup analogy. As soon as you take that deal with a major record label, you've got access to resources, you've got access to a network, you've got access to funds to go and make a great product. Um, but it comes with a trade-off. You know, that, re that record label expects something, and if you don't make it and you don't deliver it, then you can be dropped like a hot potato. And, and what about take, not taking advantage? That's a strong yeah, so, so, so not taking advantage. That, that is a really tricky one, I, and I did read a really great article um, about, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, you know, there's this ecosystem of, of technology companies that are ultimately building a business, you know, out of these, out of these people. Um, it's a hard one to answer, um, and it's definitely something I think I think the entire industry needs to be very careful of. Um, and you know, the, these companies shouldn't be selling like snake oil. It shouldn't be, oh, you know, if, if you do this, you can be a DIY artist. We're going to charge you lots of money, but you might become, become famous one day. I think I think that would be to totally the wrong thing to do. Um, but I mean, I think I think if you look at if you look at something like YouTube as an interesting example, I'm not saying it's the best example, but. On YouTube, yeah, you have this ecosystem where you you have major re re you have major record label content on there, and that's big business for somebody like um, Google and for the majors themselves. They make money on that. But at the same time, you know, it's it's enabled someone like my nephew to feel empowered to create and to make music, which is a really great thing. But if you look at the middle tier, there's definitely a new breed of creators who are YouTube native who have used those tools to empower themselves to give up their job or to focus on what they're doing best. And I believe YouTube are even kind of you know investing in in growing that talent pool. So I think I think in that case you know they're, they're, they would definitely be kind of on the creator side. But yeah, I think it's I think it is a criticism that could be levelled at, at some companies. I think the industry has to be aware of. Uh, great. Um, thank you very much, my expert panel, Michael Dave.